conversation. First of all, Tyler, thank you very much for all your help in hanging. And Tess isn't here, but she also helped. And Susan, thank you for the opportunity to show in this beautiful space. Um, it's true that the title, Ashes to Snow, does mean something. A lot of my work, as you probably have noticed, has text in it. Um, although the piece that's actually called Ashes to Snow does not have text in it. That text comes from a poem that was written by a Canadian artist, Gregory Colbert, and he had a show called Ashes to Snow, which was a show of monumental photographs that traveled around the world on a tanker, and it would stop at different ports, and the um, shipping containers that the work was packed in would be taken off the ship and put on the docks and checkerboarded down the pier, and that became the actual gallery space. The photographs were hung inside these shipping containers, and there was a pathway you know, in between them that ended in a video installation that showed a lot of how he made the photographs. He himself would be swimming with whales and photographing children with leopards and all kinds of things, and he doesn't allow anyone to be with him when he's working. I think he has sort of, uh, I mean, he must be some major animal whisperer, but anyway, this poem is what sort of, I, I think, described his show in some way to him. Um, and it's feather to fire, fire to blood, blood to bone, bone to marrow, marrow to ashes, ashes to snow. And this painting also is not titled anything to do with that. This painting is actually called Setting the River on Fire, which is a quote by Robert Lowell. And that text is in the background. You can probably see S, E, T, you know, et cetera. A lot of my, grid, my work is grid-based, and the text is almost always laid out in a grid. And the grid is another layer of patterning on the work. In this case, there's only text that's the patterning. Whereas, for instance, in this piece down the third panel of that triptych, you get you know, this, all this patterning in the background and then also the layer of text on top. Um, incidentally, that painting, the background, this one and this one are all finger painted which I don't usually do, but these are, in fact, I've probably only done five in my whole life. But um, I like to experiment with different processes when I'm working, and I think I get maybe a little bit bored easily. So if I've done something like this, then maybe I want to do this next. And then people say to me, well, geez, you know, what's, like, th this looks completely different. What's the relationship? But there may be three areas of stylistic, you might say, expression, although to think of it as stylistic is not really correct. It's more process-driven. So I like, to, I like to work with certain processes. And this particular idea, these poured ones, are the newest uh, development, and they were an outgrowth of my dripped paintings, where I had paintings with lots of drips, and then I started systematically dripping over the entire surface. And then I began to think, well, what would happen if the drips were bigger? And instead of being a linear um, you know, idea, they became volumes instead. And so I, I started doing these. And these are, I have to say, extraordinarily stressful. Part of it is they're kind of big to handle by myself. When they're wet, I cannot, my clothes can't touch, nothing can touch the surface. I have to move them around a little bit. They start pouring all over and I have cinder blocks around. I'm trying to hold them up with and ladders and different things. And then also to get a proper pouring viscosity, I needed to start to, um, experiment with different uh, acrylic mediums. And so I was mixing 
all these things together, and then I get something that really worked, but I never really knew what it was. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> so, um, and then I would do things like, like for instance, in here, there's a fair amount of an iridescent color mixed in with the um, medium that I, who knows what it was, it was like, I don't know, three or four different golden products I mixed together. And the other problem is you have no idea what it is until it dries. So even though I have a test canvas nearby that's maybe not the same color, but it's the same value. So if I'm working on dark, it's a dark one, or this like a medium one. And when I test the color on that, I, yes, it dries, I see what it is. And then after I pour it, it doesn't look anything like what that little test thing was. So there's something about doing these that it's a real shot in the dark. You just have to wing it. And the other thing is you don't really have too many chances. If you don't like the pour, although I have to say there is a purple pour under here I didn't like that I was able to cover. But one time I spent 10 months on one painting and I cut it up in the end. I never got it. It just never worked. And I kept thinking if I just would stay with it a little longer, but it never worked, you know? And cutting it up was actually the only way I could leave it, finally. Um, let me think. There, I consider this, 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 and to a lesser extent this, and also that one, all what I used to call Shakti work, which basically has to do with color expression overall color field painting and even though there's a similarity in maybe surface look they're quite different in terms of the process of how I make them and again I have to keep stay interested in my own work so some of the changes that happen happen because I'm tired of something like when I do these for a while it's kind of hard on your back because I'm painting these on a table and I'm lean, I have to draw out everything on paper first and then I'm leaning over and laying stencils under the paper and painting like that. And they're kind of, um, you know, you can get to a point where you just want to stand up afterwards, you know, and just work in a different, physically you want to have a different relationship to your, to your canvas. So then I do something else next. Um, and then another thing that happens is, like, I knew when I was working on this one that it would be a triptych from the beginning. Usually I don't know that. I do paintings and then after they're done I think, oh, that, those look good together. Or, I, I like this relationship. But this one I knew I was going to do a triptych from the get-go. And I knew it was going to be called from Gertrude Stein, A Rose is a Rose is a Rose, which is on that first panel. And then, you know, I was working on all three of them at the same time. And so the first panel looked a little lean. It didn't have enough going on. So I thought, well, I think I'll put a rose on there. That's kind of nice. And so somebody walks in my studio and said, I love that Eros. It's so cool. And I had never even seen it, you know? <laughs> I didn't even know it was there. And then at the time when I was had already those two layers on, I was getting ready to go to Cambodia and I was reading this um, memoir and I read this poem that supposedly was on these banners that hang outside a cremation pavilion, which is common, a Buddhist cremation pavilion. And um, I really liked it and so I laid in that behind afterwards. And it says, as these blossoms wilt away, so my body succumbs to its inevitable end. And in this painting, um, then the other, which I'll say later, is a Robert Lowell. This work is some of the first work I've done where I felt like the text didn't need to relate on the same canvas. I thought it doesn't matter if the feeling's completely different, they're culturally, you know, opposite, they're whatever they are. I thought, it's okay because I'm the connective tissue. You know, it doesn't have to be, because I, it's, it's happening all at a certain time in my life, that's good enough to justify it all being on 
one canvas. The piece on the end, I thought was finished, and then I was reading a uh, biography about Robert Lowell, and I was like blown away by this piece of writing, and I thought, you know, if you just wrote this and you died, you left something really amazing behind in your life. It says, um, if we leaned forward and should dip a finger into this river's momentary black flow, infinite small stars would break like fish. So anyway, so let me think what. Well, I'm running out of things to say here. Okay, the silver, this, you know, I've done a fair number of these metallic leaf paintings and you know, the squares, for anybody that hasn't seen it, the squares are like this big. That's not silver leaf, it's actually aluminum. The gold is titanium and, you know, you could get the actual metals, but I reckon enough of it as it is. <laughs> um, it's the same kind of weight. So in other words, when you're working with this, I can't have fans on usually or air conditioning or any air moving in my studio because it just flies around all over the place. Um, and so in this case, you know, I painted a color all over and then when I put the, and I don't measure anything out, I just start doing it because if you measure it, I think it gets too, uh, maybe too rigid looking. So I think it's better to just do it by eye. However, because they're squares, I still consider this grid work, you know. And then I tear it. Sometimes it tears <laughs> when I don't mean it to tear. But then if it doesn't tear enough, I tear it with my brush. So there's a, so again, you're getting an uneven, but still over the whole surface pattern of color coming through. And these are actually, I think when you see them in a gallery, they they're not as interesting as when you see them in another situation because like if you see that at night or when the lights are off, sometimes it can get way brighter or if you see those under candlelight, they're completely different. If you see, it really depends what the light is like on them. The, whole, the surface totally changes and becomes live under very different lighting situations. Does anybody have questions? Yeah, Marilyn. I don't know who he is, I don't think. Huh. Which is what, a product? Huh. Yeah, I don't know. I just bought a new product that I haven't tried yet. It's a pouring medium that um, we'll see. The problem with the pouring medium, or what could be a problem, and you never know till you try it, is if it's thin enough, it moves fast, usually. If it's too thick, it may not be moving enough. You know, you, you have to have something that gives you an opportunity to create some shape without having it run over you, you know? Um, so, I don't know. I'm still, I'm going to do a lot more work in this area just because I have a lot more to learn about how to manipulate it. Thank you. Yes? Well, these are all different mixes that are on here. And um, geez, I mean, I would say I don't screw around with them very long. I mean, maybe about only maybe like 10 or 15 minutes, and then I leave it for at least 24 hours. I only do one pour at a time because I don't know the color. So since I don't know the color, I don't really want to 
And you can't add another color without changing the shape of what you just poured. So it's a, it's a little bit, um, I guess you could say it's a little bit time consuming. On the other hand, you can go and do a pour and then take the rest of the day off. <laughs> Or you could work on another one that's up against the wall, you know. But. I have a question. Yeah, kind of, but they do. They do. Mostly they do. Yeah. And um, uh, I mean, I understand that people think they don't have space, but I'll tell you, people have more space than they think they have. I live in a 50s ranch house, and I can hang triptychs in my house. So, you know, it's not a big house. It's a, it's a modest ranch house. So, of course, you maybe can't hang it, so there's a lot of room all around it. But, um, you know, you can, you can fit more into space than you think you can. And you can consolidate hanging, too, you know? Deborah. Okay, um, yeah, I fr the first one I did was quite a long time ago, was maybe about 10 years ago, I did one, just one, and then that was all I did. And again, they're fun when you start, because when you start, you know, I'll have a glove on. When I start, I can use five fingers, but not for very long, because then you start to get holes or you need to fill in more color somewhere than somewhere else. So as painting goes on, you're using fewer and fewer fingers. So finally at the end, maybe you're taking one dot and putting it around. And because I only have uh, stools and cinder blocks and stuff to paint on, you know, I might be like bending over and it gets a little bit not so comfortable. I think if you had one of those you know, some kind of system where you had a hydraulic lift or something where you could just lift the painting up and keep standing the whole time. It would have like much less wear and tear on your body, but that isn't really happening. However, I love the look of these. And again, in a bright setting like this, you're not getting the same look of it under a lower light. Maybe this one has to have high light because it's so, dark, it just drinks water. But all three of these have, um, if not metallics, there's something called um, iron oxide. It's called micaceous iron oxide. And I think what it is actually is little tiny chips of mica in the paint. And so when the light hits it, you get this kind of, it's, it's almost like glitter, but it's not as, um, it's not as sort of tacky. <laughs> Well, not, not that I have any objections to that either, but I mean, it's, more, it's a little more subtle, you know? And um, you, don't, you tend not to see that in very strong light. But like this one has, uh, this is a uh, kind of a, that's actually a metallic color in there. Um, and then this has more of that micaceous in here but the micaceous here was mixed a little bit, so it's not quite as reflective as it is down at the end. And what are the colors in the, the, the piece? The here? Yeah, I call this one seeing in the dark. And, um, well, I mean, you know, they're mixed colors, so what can I say? They're, they're dark, obviously, and I just had this feeling like I really wanted to make a very dark blue painting. And another thing is, I, if, I, if I were younger and stronger, I would even do bigger paintings, but right now, this is like about what I can handle. But what is important to me, because I work with color so much, is that you should be able to walk in to the visual field. And when you walk into it, you have a relationship with it that you don't have when you look at something. That's a different, so there's nothing wrong with that. It's just different. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to be able to have something like that where you could just like walk in and kind of just go away in there, you know? Um, and that's part of what I like about this sort of overall patterning stuff. You don't get hung up on what you're looking at. 
It's like you can allow an experience of looking to be what it's about. Yeah, yeah, because basically, yeah, yeah, because basically they're complementary colors. You know, when I used to first on my early Shakti work in the mid 90s, I always did, you know, the complementary color. If I wanted to make a red painting, I started with blues and greens and painted the whole thing blues and greens. And then I started painting it out with the red, leaving little bits of it showing so that the juxtaposition vibrated. And so the whole point of those paintings was to be almost like um, flint or something. It was like this abrasive thing that just gave energy. And yet the process of putting down either a stroke or a dot or whatever over and over and over again is on another level very meditative looking. So it would feel both energetic and quiet at the same time. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah. I don't think emotion is something that is for me <laughs> so much, sorry. I mean, I think I'm more like, um, there's more of a sensate, visceral thing that I, that I connect with. And for instance, when I was doing this, I had just done, I just done one of these, I can't remember which, and I just was ready for some color, you know, and I thought, I need some red, I really need red. So, I decided on the color before I even knew anything that was going on. And that's another thing. People sometimes ask me, what do you start with? And I, sometimes I start with text. Sometimes I start with color. Sometimes I start with process. You know, it depends what, it, it, it's, I don't know. It just, it just sort of depends on, but that one I definitely remember I painted red first. And then I thought, okay, now I think I know where I'm going, but I started with the red. And this one, this kind of painting I enjoy doing because I love to, um, there's something about how your eye bops around on the surface with the color that makes it very fun to do. Um, and then you'll, you'll get it done and say, oh, that yellow, that B has to be changed to another color, that E has to go somewhere else. So I have no problem changing it however many times I think I need to change it to. Yes. Right. It comes both ways. But one of the things, too, just as a background to that, my older work was my oldest work was just titled with numbers, and you did this too, and th <laughs> Carol didn't like it. But um, then when I started naming work, I was naming it with quotes, like Neruda, the sea and the bells would be the title of the painting. I, liked, I like titles that are evocative rather than descriptive. And so, Essentially, what happened is the title started entering the work, where I actually took the text and decided to make them part of the painting. But when I'm reading, a lot of times I will copy something down that really strikes me, and I just put it in a little folder, 
and sometimes it's in the folder for five, eight years or something, and then all of a sudden it strikes me as very seminal, you know? And, and I also feel like because of the world we live in now with all of this data that just comes in like a tsunami all the time, we're not able to extract any stillness. That's almost the hardest thing to get to now. And often text allows you to do that. It allows you to like quietly process something. And the whole idea of a painting is to me is quietly being with something. It's, an, it's a singular, insular, individual relationship that you have with something. And yes, I love to read. I mean, my idea of heaven just about is curled up on a lounge chair. And I like to read, this is also interesting, the older I get, I like to read slowly. When I was younger, I used to devour books, like I just read them and throw it off and get a new one, you know? It was like a little crazy. And now I'm just like, I read almost like I'm just learning how to read. It's like, and I like to stop and think about it a little bit. And it's just this wonderful experience, you know? So, yeah. This one was actually, um, Again, a later one. I was wondering what it would look like if I took some of my, well, there isn't really any in this show, but my earlier Shakti work, and if I really blew it up so you were only seeing a little bit of it, what it might look like, and I think that's what it might look like. So the, the mixed colors that might have been underneath but very much compressed next to each other in small amounts, now it's, it's pulled out and expanded. And um, so in a way, I do think that one has, a, it has quite a different look maybe than some of the other things in here. And that one is called um, Like a Hyacinth in the Mountains, which is a Sappho line. Huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did actually think that one had a lot of water feeling to it. But I was sort of trying not to let that get into the title, but um, you know, actually, that whole poem, which I didn't think it suited the painting, but I really loved it. It's like a hyacinth in the mountain, trampled by shepherds until nothing remains but a purple stain. Isn't that an amazing one? It's a good one. But, but it has this kind of, it has a feeling that just doesn't go with that, so I didn't want to use the whole thing. But still, it's worth sharing because it's a good one. Excuse me? Yes. Yes. First of all, the square is a definite outgrowth of grid work. Before I even did big canvases, when I, I lived in Nashville and then I moved out into the woods. When I moved into the woods, my work didn't fit in any vehicles. So I had to figure out how to make work that I could transport in my Honda Civic. And I've always painted rather large things, so I had to figure out how to do it. So what I did was I just made 17-inch squares, and all my paintings were made of 17. And I just picked that. No, there were 16, because I like the number 7, so 1 and 6 was 7. So I made 16-inch squares, and then I could configure them however I wanted. You know, like some paintings would only have six squares, and some would have, you know, like 24 squares or some, you know, a lot of squares in them. And um, so I got in the habit of working with a particular size. And when I was doing that, it was actually very interesting because some of the squares 
related to one another. A stroke might go from one into another, but I didn't want them all connected like a puzzle. I didn't want it that rigid uh, a thing. So some, some connected, some didn't. Um, anyway, then when I got back into town and I could start doing bigger pieces again, the square, to me, always implies a grid. You know, even if the grid is not on the surface, like, of course, the grid's on the surface with all of, you know, certain ones of these. But being square itself implies a, a grid. And um, the way, because I like to be able to walk into a surface, especially from a color point of view, that's about, you can't really go any smaller than this and be able to do that, I don't think. Um, and it would be even better if it were bigger, but I can't really handle it that easily since I do all my, I mean, I don't build the bars, but and now I've just been finally, fi I found a place to get them already stretched now, but until a couple months ago, I've, you know, stretched and gessoed and done everything myself. So it's, a, it's fairly physical and, um, that's about the size I can manage. And then also, I do, I have to say, I, you know, I'm a Virgo, so I like a certain amount of order. I like the way it looks when you hang something to be all, um, I like the, this clean presentation. And um, if at some point I felt that I had exhausted all the possibilities for this size, I might try something else, but it hasn't happened yet. So, and then I was telling Susan, I'm, I hang all the D rings from the exact same distance down on the back and the same end. So you can hang the show in like five minutes, you know? <laughs> you just decide where you want to do it. You get a level and boom, 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 which also appeals to me. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other questions? I mean, I'm so happy to have this show here. Thank you so much, Susan. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs>